throughout history, our most effective leaders have one thing in common, a clear vision. Yes, yes, yada yada, but what about now, today, your world and your business? It's tough out there, new technologies, infotainment, instant opinion. How do today's executive class stay in front? Well, one thing hasn't changed. The very essence of leadership is that you have to have a vision. You can't blow an uncertain trumpet. <laughs> Adidas CEO Herbert Heiner has a very certain trumpet. You might remember we went to the stock market in 1995 and then we had four or five good years, but then we came a little bit too self-complacent, a little bit too uh, self-confident. We were not aggressive anymore, the processes were not harmonized uh, anymore, our lack of innovation was shining through. Uh, so my job was not to uh, revolutionize the company again. We had very good pillars for our company, but my job was to make the whole ship much faster and make out of a big tanker speedboats again. Heiner's understanding of this incredibly complex job acquiring technologies and companies, divesting others, the sheer scale of staff and materials all boils down to and gets filtered through that vision statement. Does this make us quicker? The result? Three years after Heine took the helm, Adidas revenues hit 10.5 billion euros, within spitting distance of Nike's 11.1 billion. A vision is so powerful that it can create leaders. Patrick Doyle was the marketing head at Domino's when he grasped a painful truth about the company. The 13 years I've been here, we always knew that the consumer didn't give us as much credit for the quality of our pizza as we thought we should get. So we always knew there was a perception problem. Doyle had a vision for turning that perception around and for a new open communication style at Domino's. So we went out and we said, is there something we can do that's dramatic to the pizza that they'll notice it and that they'll give us credit for having made a dramatic change? There comes a time when you know you've got to make a change. The results are a dramatic increase in dough, ho ho. Domino's fourth quarter profits in 2009 rose to $23.6 million, more than double 2008 figures. And franchisees across the US are reporting store sales up 1.4%. So how do you establish your vision? How do you identify yourself as a leader and not a manager? To find out, Meet the Boss TV attended the premier gathering of communications executives TM Forum. You always, when you say yes to a new position, have a vision, or else you should not take it. The vision starts off about, you know, how, what do your customers want? How are you going to be successful in business? I did have a vision. I came to the leadership role with a plan. I joined the company as a result of an acquisition, so I, I came in as a result of a change in ownership. And I had a general plan, but I hadn't yet figured out how that was all going to work. Some people got enrolled in that opportunity right away and they said, great, I like the big general picture, I like the general idea, and I like the opportunity to help steer the details. And other people sort of hung back and said, well, I can't really commit to this until I understand chapter and verse how it's all going to work. And that uh, was a very telling indicator two years later who was with us and who was not with us any longer. I will start my vision by uh, storytelling. So instead of saying, I would like to do this and this, I typically say, wouldn't it be nice if, and then I tell a little story. And I repeat it over time, and uh, then it's not seen as a change, but uh, suddenly I hear them speak my words, and then I know it's time for changing. People are so important because if you, if you don't take them on the journey, and as they say, if you don't get the right people on the buses, then you're not gonna get there. Ah yes, people, buses, in all their brilliant, intelligent, customer-focused glory. Like a vision needs conviction, a leader needs followers. So how do our experts gather their teams around them? I think if you bring the customer's voice inside of the company, uh, you carry a lot of weight. Charm, lots of charm. Um, communicate like crazy. Um, have lots of uh, meetings, but not boring, endless meetings, but 
uh, meetings to try and acknowledge here's what's known, here's what's not known. Um, even when there's no new information, the fact that there's no new information is reassuring to people who are worried and anxious. We spend a lot of time, you know, sitting in workshops, small groups. Uh, we go off site for this. We turn our mobile phones off. You know, we do a lot of whiteboarding. We put up straw men and we attack, attack them and we, you know, we pull things apart and, you know, we do this in a very egoless way. I think it's just an open dialogue, um, creating an atmosphere where it's okay to say anything. Um, and uh, you know, eventually you get people in the same direction. I, I don't think we've ever come out of these sessions without people believing in what we've agreed on. In all that good advice, you may have missed a common blind spot that can derail even the strongest leaders. Michael Lowry said, you don't just need people on your journey, you need... And the right people, right people, right people on the buses. John Albers explains. One of the worst mistakes you can do as a CEO is to surround yourself with people that are just like you or think like you. You've got to you know, look at all 360 degrees of um, people's skills, their biases, their backgrounds, um, and you've got to you know, create these teams that have the right complementary sets of, of those inputs. In this instance, the right people and the right mix will inevitably lead to conflict. Call it healthy debate if you want, but resolving that conflict is a key part of delivering on your vision. First of all, you have to recognize it's not personal. <laughs> it's like number one. <laughs> it's not personal. Uh, people have opposing views, generally strong views, because they're well-educated in the market, they have experiences, um, in my role, I try to listen as much as I can and try to weigh as much of, uh, of the internal and external perspectives together. Um, I can't make an argument based on uh, my own feelings. I have to make an argument based on here are the facts that we see. You want to, if we want to discuss the facts, uh, then people can get behind that and they can see their vision and their view impacting our strategy and it becomes their own. Um, and that's really, the, I, th I think, the best approach. Well, I think you've really got to give people very clear uh, measures, very clear uh, ability to be able to achieve, achieve certain things, certain targets, but also give them a bit of a stretch because if you just meet your targets every year, if you meet what's given to you all the time, then you're not really being stretched. You're not allowing them to innovate. And I think by stretching people, you actually allow them to innovate because they think, gee, this is hard to do, this is tough. Uh, so I've got to do something different to what I normally do if I'm going to get there at the end of the day. You also have to be aware that uh, one rotten uh, apple in a basket can kill it all. And uh, you have to be very aware of that. So they are typically people that have to leave. Good leaders, the best leaders, have a clear vision. They coalesce people around that vision by involving them in the details, the nuts and bolts of how we get there, the creation of a strategy. They build teams with different skills and create a forum where conflict is embraced. Then they use the voice of the customer, market analysis and hard facts to remove the emotion from that conflict and tie people back to the vision. Does it really work? Well, here's a very candid Nick Ogden. Entrepreneurs will tell you that you know they, it's all planned out and all the rest of it. The reality is that a lot of it is luck. Um, at WorldPay, we grew the company from 1999. I think we had about 27 employees, and by late 2001, we had 275. Um, in setting up Voice Commerce Group, a number of those individuals, the, the technicians, left in 2003 to join me, and then moved to Dubai to help set the business up. And then as the business has become more commercialized, uh, I'm now in the very fortunate position that 95% of our company worked for me previously in WorldPay. Now, we don't pay well, and I'm a dreadful boss, so, you know, they must share the vision. For more fantastic interviews directly related to your business, be sure to explore Meet the Boss TV.